So we've got a lot to talk to uh, talk about today, including this field hearing, Willie, which, wow, I mean, they were really <laughs> out to make a point, but I, I don't know, uh, wasting a lot of time and money. Yeah, you have congressmen and women from Ohio and Georgia and other places suddenly deeply concerned about crime in New York City when it happens to be the district attorney is taking on their guy, Donald right. Trump. Congress was back in session yesterday after a two-week recess, but instead of being up on Capitol Hill, the Republican-led House Judiciary Committee took its work on the road for a field hearing, as they're calling it, in New York City. In Manhattan, Republican lawmakers looked to discredit the district attorney prosecuting former President Trump by blaming him for a post-pandemic spike in crime. This even as data shows a decrease in crime in New York since D.A. Alvin Bragg took office last year. During the hearing titled Victims of Violent Crime in Manhattan, Republicans brought in several witnesses personally affected by violence who had varying degrees of grievance toward the Democratic Party. Democrats, meanwhile, accused Republicans of using their committee power to defend former President Trump. For the district attorney, justice isn't blind. It's about looking for opportunities to advance a political agenda, a radical political agenda. It is shameful that the Republicans of this committee would use the pretext of violent crime as an excuse to play tourist in New York and bully the district attorney. Mr. Bragg, I hope you're watching. I hope you're watching today, sir. You're a disgrace. You're a danger to this country. This isn't governance. It's not working for the American people. It's grandstanding. It's a stunt. Just look at all the cameras here. This, unfortunately, is what we get in Joe Biden's America and Alvin Bragg's New York City. The Republican witnesses who have used their time to criticize District Attorney Bragg have served as props in a MAGA Broadway production. I'll just ask, was it former President Trump, Ms. Brame, that killed your son? No. You tried to get Trump out. You couldn't get him out. Let's face reality. You tried. The dossier was a fake. The purpose of this hearing is to cover up for what they know to be an inappropriate investigation. Now, I look forward, many of you are Can I in New York City. You, no, not right now, because I only have 20 seconds, I'm sorry. But I, I do Don't want to Don't insult my intelligence. That, uh, you're uh, not hang on, hang on. The gentleman's time. I'm not insulting okay, you're, you're trying to insult me like I'm not aware of Ms. what's going Ms. on Brain. here. Thank you. Okay? I'm fully really aware of what's going on here. Gentlemen, they will suspend. Okay? Gentlemen, gets another 15 seconds. Thank you. That's why I walked away from the plantation of the Democratic Party. Congressman Goldman, who oh, you saw right there, okay. we're going to talk to you on our show in just a moment. So, Mara, it went on like that for a long time. I mean, these some of these people, all, most of the people, are legitimate victims of crime right. in New York City. But the idea that on your first day back from this break to have Jim Jordan and congressmen from California and Texas coming here, clearly, transparently, to put a dent into Alvin Bragg as he prosecutes Donald Trump. Well, I don't think it was very effective. I mean, one of the strange things, just there was no photo op for them. So they were in New York, but they could have been in any room anywhere in the country in this tiny federal space. That was strange. But also, it's just disgusting to see uh, lawmakers of any party exploiting the grief yes. of mm -hmm. <clears throat> cherry-picked, hand-picked individual victims of crime um, and their family members uh, for their own political purposes. There's something extremely disgusting about that. And of course, we know, uh, just like any other population, um, victims of crime have all kinds of different political views. And so these were, these were obviously cherry-picked. And then, of course, you have the hypocrisy um, because, you know, there are places like Columbus, Ohio, that actually uh, where Jim Jordan well, is from that have higher rates of crime than New York City. That's a so. great point. And, uh, you know, when you look at what is happening across the country, I uh, would love to see a, a field hearing across America and a national conversation on mass shootings. Right. I mean, if we really want to talk about crime and what is the leading cause of death in the nation's children, then let's have a hearing. But no, this was all about Trump again and Jim Jordan's addiction, Gene Robinson, to Donald Trump and to making sort of some sort of show, circus, gesture uh, politically.
Yeah, it was a travesty, a sham, a circus. And as Mara said, it was not particularly effective because uh, it, it could have been uh, you know, a basement committee hearing room on Capitol Hill for all the visuals we got from it. It was uh, it's ridiculous, actually. I, I don't think uh, it had any particular impact on Alvin Bragg. Um, I, and it's these stunts um, basically are what this House majority can do, right? It, I mean, it's not clear, for example, that they can uh, do do the responsible thing and raise the debt ceiling, even if they want to, um, uh, because they're such a tiny majority and they can't agree on a lot of things, but they can agree on bashing uh, Alvin Bragg and for some reason, George Soros. Um, and and that's that's their play. That's all they got. It's about political priorities here. I mean, the K Congress does occasionally take the field trips. They did one to the border because they think immigration is significant and a way to attack the Biden administration here in New York City, where it's obviously an attempt to defend Donald Trump by going after Alvin Bragg and also the attorney, state attorney general, Letitia James, uh, who mm -hmm. has led the civil suit against Trump. Uh, it, it, and we have seen during the course of this Trump relentlessly bashing the prosecutors involved on True social as this trial begins to, to there. Uh, this is something where it's about Republicans here, Mika, to your point about mass shootings, about the debt ceiling. We finally heard a little bit from Speaker McCarthy about that yesterday. But what the Republican Party is banking on, what they think their voters want to hear is defending Donald Trump, talking about Hunter Biden, horror right. stories uh, that other cable networks can, can pick up, and instead of doing the work of the American people. It's about, it's, it is indeed, it's a political stunt in theater and a waste of taxpayers' money. Yeah, and there's two issues right now that are um, boiling over. Mass shootings being, like, uh, like I said, an epidemic, but also our children are scared to go to school. People are scared to go to events. And then the issue of abortion, which we'll be getting to. But um, and we have a lot of examples um, and even a guest today will show how these laws and these changes and the overturning of Roe is impacting the health of women across America, Republican or Democrat. <laughs> it is impacting their health. Um, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is escalating his political battle against Disney, Walt Disney World. Isn't that like one of their biggest employers in Florida? Mm, yeah, got it. Yeah. And sort of what they do, <laughs> tourism, right. At a news conference near Orlando yesterday, DeSantis outlined his next moves, vowing to nullify an agreement that allows the amusement park to circumvent his newly appointed state board. DeSantis then suggested the idea of developing land next to the park, which he says could include a state park, a rival amusement park, or even a state prison. Mm. He also floated the idea that the board could look into raising its tax rates, a move that would result in more costs for Disney. The feud started over a year ago after Disney came out against Florida's Parental Rights in Education bill, which banned classroom instruction about sexual orientation and gender identity in lower grades. DeSantis has since announced plans to expand the ban at, uh, to all grade levels, which doesn't require legislative approval. So we could have a conversation about that or about, I, I mean, ha talk about like stepping on a rake getting in a fight with your largest employer. It's it's also just, <clears throat> it's starting to get a little weird. I yeah. mean, and feel a little personal. Like, oh, if, deeply. you know, I mean, <laughs> deeply. I mean, you're in a fight basically with Mickey Mouse and it's like, why is this, why is this happening to you so personally? I mean, it is also strange because of course, DeSantis is trying to build his national profile. And it's a pretty odd way to do that by attacking Disney World, <laughs> the, the destination, uh, the, the desired destination of all children in America. I mean, yeah. I don't really see Although how that the issues helps. in which why he's attacking them, Gene Robinson, is very um, appealing, I think, locally. But I thought mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis was working on a presidential campaign. Well, we thought so. He's not, he's not doing a very good job of it, to tell you the truth. And this is just weird. This obsession DeSantis has with having the last word over 
Disney. I mean, they, you know, Disney uh, uh, did a, a maneuver that caught him flat-footed. Uh, he tried to put this board uh, in, in charge of, of Disney and Disney World, and, and they sort of maneuvered him in advance, and he didn't know about it, and and so he's, he's just fuming and steaming. But this says a lot about Ron DeSantis and mm -hmm. about, about, frankly, his unfitness uh, to even think about being president. President, I mean, can you imagine uh, trying to conduct foreign policy with this sort of grudge match uh, yeah. attitude, you know, toward uh, our our adversaries or our allies or anybody who who got under his very very thin skin? This mm -hmm. is this is uh, on the one hand really really worrisome about DeSantis, and it's also like really funny. It is the state's biggest employer. It is the place where every child in America wants to go. Why are we going to fight Mickey Mouse? This is just stupid. <laughs> Yeah. And, and Caddy Bob Iger, who, who runs Disney, famously said a couple of weeks ago, this is an anti-business position. He said, we're about to spend, I think, $17 billion in the state over the next few years and hire 13,000 more people and all the things that Disney does. I mean, Joe has talked about this as a guy from Florida. I mean, Disney is Florida. Tourism is. is Florida. Uh, Universal, we throw in there as well. But, you know, Disney originally <laughs> Absolutely. was, of course, oh, right, yeah. America's well greatest I mean, theme park. Yeah. Without, without question, Harry but but this is just yeah Harry Potter. Come on, go down the list. Yeah, but this is beyond bizarre, is it not? To have this icon of your state, this this company, this business that brings billions and billions of dollars and tens of thousands of jobs to your state because your feelings were hurt on a position the company took on one issue, on one bill last year. But partly this is about Ron DeSantis, and I think it is starting to hurt him when you're st starting to see Republican donors who had been looking forward to supporting, said they'd been looking forward to supporting a DeSantis campaign, now saying, hold on a second, some of his positions, whether it's on, you know, uh, drag parades or whether it's on banning books or whether it's on taking on Disney, it's going too far, and they're now looking at him with a little bit more skepticism. So it's going to hurt Ron DeSantis personally, potentially, as a presidential candidate, but I think it says something something broader about the direction of the Republican Party, and Joe has mentioned this, you know, is, is the Republican Party oddly becoming the anti-business party, which is mm -hmm. flipping history on its head, exactly. and it's not just in Florida, you're seeing them do it in Texas too, where the Texas legislature is starting to enact uh, social conservative rulings that could have an impact on the way that businesses are able or want to operate in Texas. And, you know, Texas is a booming state, but the Republican Party, paradoxically, could be about to hold the state back economically just because businesses don't like the intervention. They don't want business. Amer businesses don't expect the Republican Party to intervene in the way they do business in the way that the Republican Party of today seems to be doing. And Mika, to further Caddy's point, it's the book bans, it's this fight with Disney, right. it's the restrictive abortion ban. This right. is Governor DeSantis as he's trying to build a national profile, How seemingly embracing you? policies and positions to, that are aimed at a shrinking portion of the electorate. Certainly not enough to win nationally. And at the moment, not enough to win a nomination as he's sinking in the polls. Donors are having second thoughts. Trump has opened exactly. up his lead. Meanwhile, he's also ignored issues in his own backyard. We were saying yesterday, the flooding in Fort Lauderdale, historic flooding My in recent God. days, never appeared. Santa's never visited the site. That's amazing. And then, of course, the 11 p.m. tweet about the six-week abortion ban. I mean, it's just... It's a, it is an interesting tactic for someone who wants, who's got a book and has gone to New Hampshire and, you know, is seemingly wanting to run for president. Again, possibly what it appears to be is a losing proposition, but we shall see. The man whom Trump reviled is running for office in Harlem. Karma, he says. And you write in part, quote, Yusef Salam, one of five black and Latino teenagers wrongfully convicted and part of a 1989 rape in Central Park is finally where he seems to belong, on the campaign trail. This is the man whose arrest prompted Donald Trump to publicly call for the death penalty in 1989 when Mr. Salam was just 15 and charged with four other teenagers with a horrific crime that they did not commit.
Mr. Trump took out full-page ads in four New York newspapers, including the New York Times, calling for the restoration of the state death penalty over the case in 2002. The young men were exonerated after serving years in prison. Mr. Trump has refused to apologize. Now that notoriety has provided Mr. Lum 49 with a platform on which to run for office, and in a twist of fate straight out of the tabloids, it's Mr. Trump who has now been indicted on criminal charges while Mr. Salam runs for office. It was karma, he said, of Mr. Trump's legal situation while sitting inside the Sugar Hill Cafe in Harlem. I hope he's able to do time, he said, with a hint of mischief in his eyes. When Mr. Trump was indicted recently, Mr. Salam expressed a kind of trust in the justice system that few might expect. I do not resort to hatred, bias or racism, as you once did, Mr. Salam wrote in a message to the former president. I am putting my faith in ju the judicial system to seek out the truth. Mr. Salam is still waiting for justice, and so is the country. And Mara, let's talk more about this, but also point out that Donald Trump is also accused of rape. The, <laughs> Just to add a little. It runs so deep. <laughs> um, you know, it's an extraordinary story. It's an extraordinary tabloid story, New York story, now an American story. But I was really moved watching Mr. Salam on the campaign trail. There's a magic to watching him. It's clearly something that you, you feel he, he's really where he's meant to be. He was kind of born to do it. Watching him retail politicking, he loves people. Um, there's a sadness about this because, yeah. of course, so much. I mean, his childhood was taken from him wrongfully. And I think one of the, the reasons I wanted to spend some time with him over the past few days is that there is a tendency, I think, to trivialize some of Donald Trump's conduct, whether they be right. crimes he was accused of here in New York right. um, or elsewhere, or simply um, harm that he has done to others over the years. This goes back a long way. And I think when you look at the, at the case of someone like Youssef Salam and the other uh, teenagers who were wrongfully convicted, um, and Donald Trump's role in that, which really was to nationalize this case and turn them into pariahs, these children. Um, you have to kind of remember, everybody deserves an equal uh, shot in the justice system, mm -hmm. no matter what you're accused of. And Donald Trump was part of a campaign to rob these children of that. Um, and I think just to kind of come full circle and just remember uh, that actually Donald Trump's conduct is serious and that he should be treated just like uh, any other defendant yeah. would. And I think that's what I heard from Harlemites, from voters on the street. They said to me, you know, we don't want to throw the book at him any more than anyone would throw the book at us. Yeah, and Rev, you know, to her uh, point about, we were just talking earlier about Stormy Daniels. Like, right. and, and again, Republicans glossing over that and going straight to, they're trivializing a lot of different things that are very important. And again, it's the fire hose of falsehoods as well as trivializing indecent behavior that is part of sort of the Trump legacy on this and, country. And, and really trivializing bigoted behavior. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, I would note, because uh, Nash Action Network was one of the few groups along with other uh, few groups that stood up for these boys, we were castigated. And Donald Trump bought these four ads. You must remember that Donald Trump never took a position on a case in New York. We had Howard Beecher race case. We had Benzer. Never opened his mouth. This was the first time he took a, a position on a case. So it was really biased. It was really something uh, that that really was was making popular hang these guys. And it was done before they even had a trial. And the, the irony of, of Youssef uh, and, and Corey Weiss, who's a member of NAM, uh, to watch him go in the same building they had to go in to be arraigned yeah. and have Meaning. the graciousness right. and, and to take the high road. I was so proud of them and glad we stood up for them, but proud of them. They didn't give him the bitterness, uh, oh. and you can talk to this, that, that they, they didn't give him the bitterness or the rancor that he gave them, and he had attacked them, and they wouldn't well, attack him. Their dignity shows just how small exactly. mm -hmm. Donald Trump really is exactly well, that mm -hmm. what stood out to me was that line in the piece where Youssef Salam says I put my faith in the justice system a justice system that took away his childhood a justice system that cost him so much he's saying I trust this system yeah with if Donald Trump is guilty to find him guilty if he's innocent to let him walk away from it that's a pretty extraordinary statement particularly remarkable from him. truly remarkable
We often hear from lawmakers in Republican-led states after legislation that limits or bans abortions is passed, but we don't often hear from the women and their families whose lives are directly impacted by these restrictive laws. This morning, we have one of those women from Florida joining us to share her deeply personal story. Deborah Dorbert learned that she was pregnant last August, but 23 weeks, weeks into what seemed to be a normal pregnancy just before Thanksgiving, an ultrasound revealed the baby suffered from a lethal condition called Potter syndrome. Babies with Potter syndrome often die before they're born or suffocate within minutes or hours after birth. After agonizing over what to do, Deborah and her family made the extremely difficult decision to terminate the pregnancy. But her doctors and their lawyers refused, fearful they would run afoul of Florida's 15-week abortion ban. Just last week, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed a law moving that ban up to six weeks. Deborah's primary care doctor was so frustrated with the situation, he spoke out on social media. So I have a patient who is about 32 weeks pregnant, who found out back in November that her fetus is not gonna survive. There are no developing bladder or kidneys, and therefore, that's incompatible with life. Now, because of the new Florida abortion laws that have been passed by the Republicans here, she has to carry this baby to term, which is at least to 37 weeks. Now, there is no doctor willing to terminate this pregnancy because of the laws that are here and the concern that the government could come after a physician. Without any other feasible options, Deborah was forced to carry the pregnancy to term, delivering the baby who died shortly after birth. Deborah joins us now, along with her husband, Lee Dorbert. Also with us, Deborah's primary care physician, who you saw in that video, Dr. David Berger. Thank you all very much for joining us. Deborah, um, I know this is very hard, and I appreciate your helping us understand these situations and sharing your story with us. Um, I'd like you to bring us back, if you could, to the decision to terminate. Can you explain why that made the most sense given your situation? It wasn't an easy choice to make, but just the mental and physical pain um, that I was gonna have to endure with the pregnancy, um, that's kind of why we decided to go ahead and terminate um, pregnancy isn't easy as it is. And so knowing that whether I got induced or went to full term, the baby would pass after birth. Um, so we just decided to go ahead and um, terminate the pregnancy, but I ended up having to go to full term. So if you could tell us about that, um the experience of having to go to full term with a baby that you knew would not survive and um, what your reaction was when you heard that you didn't have the option to take care of yourself and perhaps lessen the pain of the baby. Uh, when we had found out it was right before Christmas and it was very heartbreaking because I knew the next couple of months was not going to be easy, both mentally and physically. Um, I dealt with a lot of, and I'm still dealing with a lot of depression and anxiety and just the physical pain through the pregnancy um, because there was no amniotic fluid. So there was no cushion for the baby. So. I mean, the baby was pushing up on my ribs and my SI, my round limit ligament. And so it was very painful. And obviously I can't take any medicine because I still am pregnant. So I felt down into like deep depression and just was in pain all the time. Um, Lee, um, tell me your reaction when when you also realized your 
wife didn't have the options that one would think she would have in a situation like this and what it was like to watch her go through this pain that she was talking about and obviously the impact on her mental health and you have uh, she has um, you you all have a another child as well that yes, you had to explain the situation to correct so my the, the first emotion, of course, is anger that we don't don't have this ability to make this decision, um, you know, to, to for what was best for our family, uh, not only what was best for her, but what was best for our son, to you know sit there and watch her belly grow and expect a child, expect a sibling, and not quite understand and uh, that 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 baby's not coming home yet, um, and then you know also it you know it's it's a part of healing. Um, you know, we obviously we were wanting a second child. We were wanting, you know, my son to have a sibling to grow up with and, you know, being able to terminate and was being able to start the healing process to possibly be able to start to have another child. And now because of the stress of this pregnancy on the on her and on her body in the uterus, her doctor is now telling us that, you know, we should be waiting on almost another year before we even try again um just to make sure that her body can properly heal before before starting this process so it, it's very it i was very angry at first um knowing that and knowing that we didn't have the ability to make the decision for ourselves of what was best for us and um you know i very quickly had to turn that into you know focusing on the positive of you know for my son uh, for my wife and, mm. you know, also for our, you know, our, our baby as well, of, you know, trying to provide as much love as we could and, and for that, mm. that, that child. I know that that, um, experience that, you, that you all went through, um, having the baby is too hard to talk about. Um, which is completely understandable. We reached out to the hospital. Uh, that you went to for a response. We didn't hear back, but a spokesman for the Lakeland Regional Health Hospital System the doctors are affiliated with did provide a statement to the Washington Post when it reached out for comment. They declined to discuss Deborah's case specifically or how it is interpreting the new law. The spokesman's statement reads in part, Lakeland Regional Health complies with all laws in the state of Florida, and and they do, um, Dr. Berger. I, I I don't even know how you help a patient in a situation like this when you cannot actually give the woman the health care she needs. You spoke out on social media. What do people need to know about terminating a pregnancy and all the different components that go into why? this procedure is necessary for a woman's health and well-being. Yeah, good morning. So obviously we've talked a lot about should the government be involved in a decision between a patient and their doctor in the first place. And because when we were doing a follow-up appointment um, as part of our annual and at first, when she told me she was pregnant, I didn't realize that all of this was going on. This was at 31 weeks. And then very quickly, the conversation turned from, oh, how can I support your pregnancy to how can I support you? And because of the platform that I do have on social media, I asked her if she wanted to be, if they wanted to be public with the story to perhaps that other people know about this going on. Perhaps laws can change. People can rally around this. And, and so really, that's why I brought it forward, because this is happening around the country. There's another case in, in Texas going on on a similar where a baby's brain is not developing and, and has no chance of real survival. So we want this to be awareness that this is happening to people all over the place and the unintended consequences of these types of restrictive bills. I'm sure that the legislators never thought that this would be the type of, of circumstance that would happen, but it happened. Yeah. Deborah, I want to give the final word to you. Um, I just want to know what you would like to say to Republican lawmakers who are creating these laws that kept you from having the options that you desperately needed? I just feel that 
I don't know, politicians should stay out of healthcare and let the doctors practice and treat their patients um, is just kind of how I feel because I feel like I didn't get the health care that I needed for this pregnancy. No. Um, I had some great doctors that helped me get through it, but they still didn't, weren't able to practice and treat me right away like I needed. Deborah and Lee Dorber, thank you both. Um, we'll be praying for you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this really traumatic story with us. And Dr. David Berger, thank you as well for being a voice for women's health. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I have a note to Republicans, uh, maybe especially Republican men. Um, just want to spell it out if that didn't for you. <clears throat> Abortion isn't just terminating a normal pregnancy. It isn't just someone who had sex without protection and wants to casually get rid of the problem, as much as Republicans would like you to think that. As you just saw, that's not what abortion is all about, not even close. I can't believe that we have to still spell it out graphically, but it seems that Republicans want to hide behind the old overused stigma about a decision to terminate a pregnancy. There are women who have been raped. There are girls who have been raped who will be forced to carry babies to term. There are women who can die within days or hours due to pregnancy complications if they cannot terminate. They might have been hemorrhaging as the placenta starts to separate from the uterus. Yes, we're going to talk about it graphically. Or a woman could become septic. A woman could have an infection in her uterus that spreads, causing organ failure. A woman could have a blood clot in her lungs where a pregnancy makes it worse and she dies of heart failure. There are pregnancy-related complications that often lead a woman and the men in her life to feel that abortion is the only option. What about preeclampsia? What about an ectopic pregnancy that ruptures? A termination in these cases saves the woman's life. Are you saying she should die? What if this was your wife or your daughter? These tragic scenarios can happen to all women. A termination of a fetus that won't survive saves a woman's life and saves her from months of having to carry the baby to term and the mental health complications and the trauma of watching their baby die. <laughs> Many Republicans want you to believe that abortion is a lazy woman's option to kill a baby rather than nurture it to life, a sin. The reality is that women are already experiencing the ramifications, as you just saw, of Roe being overturned. They are, there are women right now with unviable babies growing in their bellies who cannot get the termination they need to save their lives and to end, yes, end their pain. Just like we see in the response to one mass shooting after another, Republicans are playing a game that they will ultimately lose. In the long run, they will lose elections. In the short run, there will be a moment, possibly, when a woman they love needs health care and she won't be able to get it because of their extreme, contrived, condescending, short-sighted version of what it means to have an abortion. I hate that they will have to learn the hard way about the damage they are causing women across the country and their families. It seems like we shouldn't have to spell it out in 2023, but here we are.